Welcome to Voices of the Community, which explores critical issues facing Northern California communities. We introduce you to the voices of community thought leaders and change makers who are working on solutions that face our fellow individual community members, neighborhoods, cities, and our region. This is George Coster, your host. This episode is part of our series exploring COVID-19's impact on nonprofits and small businesses in San Francisco. We started the series back in April of 2020 during the height of the first phase of the COVID-19 pandemic and the shelter-in-place requirements. Over these past nine months, the COVID-19 pandemic and economic meltdown has wiped out millions of jobs in both the nonprofit and small business sectors, as well as shuttered tens of thousands of small business operations. The goal of the series is to shine a spotlight on the nonprofits, small businesses, and their staff who are struggling to deal with the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on their operations, services, and sustainability. The series of interviews we conducted features voices from a cross-section of organizations that make up the fabric of our community. Each of them brings a unique perspective on how they and we are dealing with the issues facing our community during the global pandemic and economic depression. In terms of the community itself, as they've felt the absence of the things they've come to count on from the arts community, that ability to just go out and see a show or go to a gallery. So there may be a new appreciation once we reopen and are able to convene again in person for what that meant and the beauty of that. But, you know, I think that you know, in terms of the the people who are working in the cultural sector and everything, it's exposed even further our vulnerabilities. The fact that we're always working in the margins, and then when something like this hits, it's catastrophic in so many cases. In this episode, our featured voices are Randy Rollinson, the executive director, and Allison Snowpack, the deputy director of Intersection for the Arts. This week's show with Randy and Allison is part of our end of year theme to highlight the importance of arts nonprofits in our community. Our conversation focuses on the arts and cultural organizations they work with and to get their insights into how the COVID-19 pandemic is impacting these organizations that bring joy and inspiration to our communal lives. We wanted to provide some economic context to our conversation with Allison and Randy. So we asked, how big is the arts and culture economy in San Francisco? The latest in-depth study we could find was a 2015 Arts and Economic Prosperity 5 National Economic Impact Study that was conducted by Americans for the Arts in partnership with the San Francisco Arts Commission. According to the study, the nonprofit arts and culture industry generates $1.45 billion in annual economic activity and supports 39,699 full-time equivalent jobs. An update to this 2015 survey can be found in an ongoing survey dashboard that Americans for the Arts has recently launched to track the economic impact of the coronavirus on the arts and culture sectors. The survey provides art and culture organizations an opportunity to report their data into the survey, which in turn generates survey results in a dashboard from a national level to a zip code level. From the 100-plus organizations in San Francisco County who've participated in the American for the Arts survey, to date, the economic impact of COVID-19 on the arts and culture sector is a loss of over $20 million to San Francisco County. The survey also found that 96% of organizations have canceled events. There have been over 60,000 staff laid off, as well as over 49,000 furloughed. Over 60% of the organizations saw reduced philanthropic giving and have limited cash reserves, with over 30% unable to make payroll and 24% closing. Other results from the survey found that 11% of the organizations who haven't closed were not confident their organization will survive the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Even with all this bad news, 89% of the arts groups are delivering artistic content to raise community spirits and morale during social distancing and quarantine. And on a national level, according to the Bureau of Economic Analysis, the creative economy employs 5.1 million Americans and contributes $877 billion annually to GDP. I'm joined remotely via Zoom by Randy Rollison, the Executive Director, and Allison Snowpack, the Deputy Director of Intersection for the Arts. 
Thank you for being here, Randy and Allison. Nice to be with you. Yeah, thanks for having us. So, Randy, I'd like to turn to you first and please provide our audience a little overview of who is Intersection for the Arts and the kinds of services that you provide individual artists and art organizations here in the Bay Area. Well, Intersection for the Arts has been around since the early 1960s, and it was actually founded by artists who were working in the Tenderloin to reach the youth there and help them out. And it's carried forward a tradition of working with artists who are deeply invested in community over all these decades. We were based in North Beach for a while, and then the Mission, and then now we're downtown in Civic Center. And we used to have a a really robust theater and gallery program, and then the organization had to reinvent in 2014. And what we did was decide to focus on one of the key things that had been a through line for Intersection, which is its support of artists in their work. So Intersection used to have like a radio show back in the 60s and 70s about opportunities throughout the Bay Area. And then we were one of the first adopters of fiscal sponsorship, which is the ability to be able to use an organization's 501c3, extend that use to others who are working for the same charitable purpose. And so that has been a very robust program all through the decades. And so when we reinvented, we really change the focus solely to providing artists and cultural workers with resources in order to thrive. So we do that through fiscal sponsorship, but we take a more holistic approach and we work with artists who are creating these amazing organizations and they're accidental administrators. And so we really want to, you know, help them develop their professional capacities and their ability to raise money, write a compelling pitch for support, What is the business model underneath their organization or their individual artist practice? So we provide uh, a lot of workshops, mentorship, coaching, technical assistance, and really, like I said, take a holistic approach because it could be pretty lonely work when you start out one of these enterprises. And then we want to let them know that, you know, they're within a community and there's a support system for them. Thank you. That was great. Allison, could you kind of walk us through the artists and art organizations that you work with at Intersection for the Arts? Yeah. So we currently have about 157 members who are under fiscal sponsorship. That number is constantly growing and fluctuating. And we're working with artists and arts organizations that use their work in the arts and culture sector to make a positive impact within their communities. So most of them are working with historically underserved populations and then creating and providing access to the arts. Most are in the Bay Area, but some projects have a broader reach and there's a wide range of the types of organizations and artistic disciplines that we're working with. So for example, we have groups that do work to bring arts to correctional facilities. We have community cultural centers like the American Indian Cultural Center and the Tahitian Cultural Center. We've got groups that work in music, dance, and theater, doing performance out in the community and community programming. We've got arts education groups doing work with youth both in and outside of schools. We work with arts advocacy groups, literary arts groups that allow people to tell their stories, visual arts groups that are doing community murals and interactive activations out in the community. And of course, we have Voices of the Community, one of our newest fiscally sponsored projects, this podcast, telling the important stories of nonprofits and and nonprofit workers and the valuable work that they're doing. All of our members are listed on our website, theintersection.org, under the Meet Our Members section. So folks can go to the site and learn more about all of our projects, read about their missions, click through to their direct websites and see everything that's going on there. Thank you. So turning back to you, Randy, here we are going into month nine of the pandemic and the subsequent economic meltdown. How has COVID-19 and the economic downturn along with AB5 impacted the organizations and funders that you work with? Well, it's been quite a year, hasn't it? You know, we started the year first grappling with AB5 and the impacts that we were seeing, you know, especially in the arts, which is a a sector that has relied particularly on the the gig economy 
I mean, musicians were the original gig artists. So how it was starting to impact and what the realities are that were suddenly hitting us on the ground, having to change all these people from independent contractors to employees and, you know, the attendant costs, it's like an extra 13% in people's budgets. So we were just starting to grapple with that. And then COVID hit. And I can only describe it as, as kind of like a body blow to the sector. You had a number of different things happen immediately, like performances canceled, you know, and folks were reeling from the realities of that. They'd already invested a lot in the shows and then their ticket sales weren't going to materialize. And it started playing out in little ways like that, but it was also a a blow to the community that is used to gathering in person. And what was the new reality? And simultaneously, everybody was grappling with it on a personal level. So you've got your arts enterprise that you're working on and everything. And suddenly uh, there's this enormous upheaval, but you've got your personal thing. I'm stuck in my home and I don't know what this is. There was, remember those, the first few weeks were just like, I fully don't understand this. And then if you were trying to keep things going, like we were with Intersection, because we needed to make sure that the artists and everything were going to, you know, we could get the checks out the door. You know, I think we came up with like three different operating scenarios over the weekend before the shelter in place order happened. How were we going to keep things going? And everybody experienced that. So it's two profound things happening simultaneously. And you know, everybody kind of put away AB5 for a little while, while we grappled with the the larger reality of COVID, but it's now coming back into play. So it's two viruses at once, basically. Thank you. That's a really good description. So Allison, since you're working every day with all of the various individual artists and organizations, what are some of the needs that you're seeing that the arts and cultural community can use during the pandemic and economic impact? So as Randy mentioned, you know, the arts sector, you know, relies heavily on coming together as a community and being in person, whether that be for performances or workshops or whatever it is, not being able to gather in person is, is a huge shock. And, you know, that oftentimes can reflect their revenue streams as well if they're not selling tickets to performances and whatnot. So really just learning new ways to pivot and, you know, come up with virtual programming or outdoor programming and finding new ways to stay connected to their constituents and to stay motivated and to stay sane through all of this and stay creative and inspired. And, you know, also financially having to dig into their organizational budgets and figure out how to make things work during this time. So what we've done to kind of address this and recognize the need for information and resources. So we try to keep our projects in the loop about any emergency funding that we learn about. We have an awesome COVID-19 artist resources page that is extensive and continually updated that provides resources for emergency funding, legal resources, and other tools for learning how to pivot and stay connected. We've got an extensive artist resource directory providing arts business skills, information about granting organizations, and just trying to provide the tools and information for the community during this time of need. And so my next question is really for both of you. I'm going to go back to Randy in this one to start with. So with, you know, the economic and the pandemic and again, the AB5 component of it, what do you feel will be the largest impact on not only the artists, the organizations, but also the community itself and then our local economy? Well, I think that, you know, in terms of the community itself, as they felt the absence of the things they've come to count on, from the arts community, that ability to just go out and see a show or go to a gallery. So there may be a new appreciation once we reopen and are able to convene again in person for what that meant and the beauty of that. But, you know, I think that, you know, in terms of the the people who are working in the cultural sector and everything, it's exposed even further our vulnerabilities 
the fact that we're always working in the margins. And then when something like this hits, it's catastrophic in so many cases. But we're resilient and adaptable bunch. And I think it's showing in the way people are responding to this, how adaptable we are. Yeah, I would second that. And you know, one positive impact is knowing that we can be inventive and come up with ways to be creative and come to terms with this new reality, essentially, and finding ways to connect and express ourselves in new ways, oftentimes from home, and still staying active and connected with our arts communities. Thank you. So you've both been at this for a while. What are some of the strategies that you've identified and or that you have been working with through foundations and other nonprofits in our local city and county of San Francisco that we could execute to address the COVID-19 impact on nonprofits? Well, I think that the first thing that comes to mind for me is how are we going to adjust these organizations, the, the foundations, the government to be more agile? and to be able to bend these rigid structures to accommodate things like this as they come along. And, you know, it was interesting seeing the responsiveness of the the foundations and the government right away. Some could move quickly, the smaller foundations, and say, we're going to start issuing, you know, some emergency grants. Others are just big machines and can't move quickly. So they were kind of hamstrung by their own restrictions. And so I think that, you know, what this will probably do in terms of, say, the funding sector is that they will come together and probably rethink a a certain amount of how they do respond to the needs of community in crisis. But it goes back to, and I think that this is true of organizations that we run and everything, how agile can we be? And I think that's a, a key strategy is we've got to be built to be nimble So when things like this do come along, and they will come along again, how do we build an organization that, once again, like I said, isn't so rigid that it can't bend to accommodate things? They build buildings to withstand earthquakes. So we need to build our organizations accordingly so that we we can withstand things like this when it comes up again. Thank you. I'm hoping that all three kind of get together. The foundations, government, and nonprofit sector can come together. And one of the nicest things that I've seen come out of it is the idea of funding general overhead instead of the traditional, yes. let me fund a project, you know, show me your data, et cetera. Turning back to Allison, so folks who are watching or listening to this, how can they get engaged in supporting Intersection for the Arts and the organizations that you support? Yeah, so I mentioned earlier our website, theintersection.org. We've got a page there called Meet Our Members. So you can see all of the members that are currently fiscally sponsored and you can donate to them. There's a handy little donate button for each project. And you can also click through to their websites and learn more about what they're doing and attend their virtual programming, spread the word about what they're doing. I mean, we're again on lockdown in a you know shelter in place stay at home order and you've got to be looking for some entertainment. So check out what all these groups are doing. It's really impressive to see the way that that folks have pivoted to continue their work virtually and otherwise. And since you work with the artist firsthand, could you share a story that you think kind of exemplifies the ecosystem and community the Intersection for the Arts is fostering? Yeah. So as I've said earlier, I've been so impressed to see how folks have pivoted. And one really impressive, very visual organization that has done great work is Paint the Void. They saw an opportunity in all the boarded up storefront windows around San Francisco and the Bay Area and thought, you know, why don't we organize artists to make murals on all of the boarded up spaces and create statements for you know, how we can come together, how we can address things that are going on politically, social justice, and just COVID and just get some artwork out there. So that's a really, really wonderful product to be able to go out and see and and see something tangible happening. The other one is, and it's actually created by the same folks as Paint the Void, is the Safety Net Fund. And this was really inspiring. They contacted us on March 16th which was the day everybody started sheltering in place to set up a fund so that they could raise money to help other artists. 
And over the course of the months, they raised around $700,000. And they put out an application process. You know, if you met certain things, you could get a $500 grant. And it was a simple thing, but the impacts, you know, I think about 1,100 grants went out, which helped people just put cash in their pockets. So it was artists helping other artists. And that was really, you know, very moving to see them do something like that. I feel like Intersection for the Arts is kind of one of those organizations in the background that's enabling all this amazing arts and cultural work on the streets, but people don't really see that you're in the background making this happen. So Randy, since you've been there for a while, what do you feel has been one of the the biggest impacts of Intersection for the Arts on the San Francisco community? Yeah, people don't pay attention to the soil, just the flower that's popping out of it. And when you think about it, you know, over time, the organizations that came out of Intersection, like Litquake was a fiscal sponsored project, Galleria de la Raza, all these organizations that are a core part of the arts ecosystem in the Bay Area, a lot of them did come up through Intersection and the care and tending of those organizations in their early years. At some point, probably most San Franciscans have been touched by intersection in some way, whether they know it or not. Thank you. So final question for both of you. going to start with Allison. What would you see as positive things coming out of this economic financial crisis to support not only artists in the nonprofit sector, but our community at large? Yeah, so having to move to virtual platforms, you know, kind of being forced to learn that new skill of being comfortable with Zoom and being comfortable with putting your work onto the virtual platform, it can be really challenging for certain folks and for certain disciplines. But it's an amazing skill to have, and it allows for the work to be shared even more broadly. So, you know, a global audience can now view the work that's being done since it's virtual. Accessibility for the work that's being done, I think that's one of the very positive things that has come out of this. And how about you, Randy? I think one of the things that will emerge from this is that we need to come together, especially arts organizations, and share resources. And how do we look at things like our administrative spaces? Do we really need a whole bunch of them, or can we come together like the one we have with our co-working space? It's a low-cost space in the heart of San Francisco, where you don't have to pay the overhead for a huge office. You can just come in with us. You're under the same tent. We're going to need to look at shared back office support for administrative support for the arts. Can several organizations share one position, say a development person or something like that? How do we harness the limited resources, and they're going to be even more limited over this next period of time, to come together to work in cooperation with one another. There's going to be lots and lots of empty office space out there besides using it for housing, which we direly need. Is there an opportunity to perhaps put together a complete art, you know, nonprofit center, for example? Well, yeah, you know, we are that in a small way right now, but we're having discussions with other groups about coming together around a space alliance that would do that very thing. And You know, it's everything from the big idea of like, well, it would have dance studios and black box theaters to just like, can we just share an office space? So I think that, you know, those conversations are going to continue and I think they're going to be more important. I also think that, you know, we're going to probably have to, and I've talked, you know, with a couple of funders about this, we may need to see some consolidations, not mergers, but consolidations of organizations because there's going to be limited funding. I think that's realistic, given uh, where we are economics right now. Well, let's hope that our latest federal government round comes through between now and the end of the year. I think that will hopefully keep people in their houses and people on Zoom, if you will. Thank you, Allison and Randy, for sharing the wonderful insights into COVID-19's impact on nonprofits. And everybody who's watching and listening, we're going to make sure that they have Intersection for the Arts information, website, social media So they can uh, continue to get engaged and not only support your work, but all of the work that folks that you support as well. So please stay safe and healthy out there as we work our way through this very crazy normal. Thank you, George. (laughs) Thank you. 
That's it for this episode of Voices of the Community. You've been listening to the voice of Randy Rollinson, the Executive Director, and Allison Snowpack, the Deputy Director of Intersection for the Arts. Over these past nine-plus months of producing our series on nonprofits and small businesses, we have introduced you to the voices of arts and culture organizations such as the San Francisco Mime Troupe, City Arts and Lectures, San Francisco Performances, Serendipity Films, Word for Word, Access Dance Company, Presidio Dance Theater, Peninsula Ballet Theater, the San Francisco Girls Chorus, and performing arts venues like Z-Space and the San Francisco War Memorial and Performing Arts Center. The common theme running through all of the interviews was that our arts and culture community ecosystem is fragile and always underfunded. Many arts and culture nonprofits, along with performers and musicians, live on the edge, or they aren't prepared for a catastrophic loss of income. There is too much reliance on big philanthropy and high net worth individual donors. The COVID-19 pandemic has shut down all performances, which is a big revenue generator for the organizations, and forced the organizations to move their operations online, which is generating a lot less revenue. All of the organizations are struggling to sustain their operations until the community can gather together in person to celebrate our arts and culture. You may be asking yourself, what are we doing to help our arts and culture organizations stay alive? In our conversation with Allison and Randy, they mentioned the organization Paint the Void and their program to paint murals on boarded-up retail. Paint the Void is part of the City of San Francisco's Creative Corps, which was launched in November 2020. The pilot program is designed to provide economic opportunities for 60 San Francisco performing artists and visual artists through being deployed as community health ambassadors. The 30 visual artists will beautify storefronts with public health-themed murals in neighborhoods who are experiencing high rates of COVID-19. Creative Corps' $250,000 funding is coming out of the Office of Economic and Workforce Development and is being administered by the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts and Paint the Void. Another mashup of our artist community and business owners is nonprofit Project Archivism's Restore 49 project that links closed businesses with local artists in an effort to reimagine boarded and shuttered storefronts through art-inspired murals. Project Archivism's Restore 49 has now commissioned close to 50 murals throughout distinct neighborhoods and by artists from diverse backgrounds. After many months of organizing and lobbying, we may have a small bridge to help the performing arts community to stay alive until we can participate in live performances. The National Independent Venue Association successfully lobbied Congress and was able to get Congress to include the Save Our Stages Act into this latest COVID-19 relief bill. The package includes $15 billion set aside for live event venue operators and promoters, performing arts organizations, independent movie theaters, theatrical producers, talent representatives, and nonprofit museums. It provides grants that could reimburse venues for 45% of their losses or $10 million, whichever is less. So where do we go from here? Americans for the Arts has been advising Joe Biden and Kamala Harris on the best way to forge a new partnership between the arts and government. In early September of 2020, American for the Arts released Putting Creative Workers to Work, a template for arts and government cooperation. The template included input from cultural nonprofits and government agencies, creative gig workers, and independent artists who helped to identify specific goals that the Biden administration can put into effect. Proposed actions include an expansion of existing workforce hiring programs to include artists and creative workers, launching a program of federal arts commissions, developing an artist corps within the AmeriCorps, continuing CARES Act policies that extended benefits to the self-employed, and the creation of a new leadership position to coordinate federal arts policy. The American for the Arts Action Fund and American for the Arts are lobbying the Biden-Harris administration to create a cultural advisor to the president who would work to integrate arts into every new policy developed, along with working with the private sector to infuse creative workers into their business models. If we wanted performing arts to be there on the other side of the pandemic, we could go back to the future. 
Back in 1935, the U.S. had a national commitment to the performing arts in the form of the Federal Theater Project, which was part of the New Deal WPA program. The purpose of the Federal Theater Project was to reemploy theater workers, to provide theater to the public for free, and to establish theater as a vital asset in the community that would live beyond the federal program. During its short four years of existence, 30 million people watched 1,200 productions in 200 venues from closed-off streets and hospitals to parks and shuttered theaters. The challenge for the incoming administration is to get all the players, government, private industry, and the creative community working together to advance their mutual interest and to embrace our artists as valuable contributing members of our communities and society. A New Year's resolution for the arts would be for the new administration in Washington to help us build back our performing arts community better through creating an updated federal performing arts project with the new Artist Corps that works hand-in-hand with our cultural nonprofits, governments, and private sector ecosystem and truly make the arts as important as transportation, education, business, and the military. Another example of seeing arts and cultural services as part of the commons of our society is Europe's commitment to the arts. Angela Merkel's initial campaign to help organizations and artists in Germany was to provide 50 billion euros, or $59 billion, specifically to small businesses and freelancers and the cultural, creative, and media sectors. And the city of Berlin provided $1.4 billion, or $1.7 billion, in the form of individual $6,000 grants to freelancers and $17,000 to small businesses. Our expectation for the arts and cultural community is that we expect it to be there, but like so much in our society, we don't want to pay for it. We hope that you enjoyed the insights, points of view, and personal stories from the voices of changemakers and their nonprofits and small businesses featured in this series. To find out more and get engaged with the nonprofits, small businesses, and staff members featured in this series, please go to my website, georgecoster.com, and click on Voices of the Community to find links to the extended versions of these interviews and to listen to the entire series. After listening to these stories, we hope that you will consider making a donation and volunteering to provide a hand up to your fellow community members. I want to thank my associate producer, Eric Estrada, along with Mel, Lila, Michael, and Laura at the San Francisco Public Press and KSFP. To listen to our next episode in this series and to our archived past shows, which feature community voices working on solutions to critical issues facing Northern California communities, please go to georgecoster.com. While you're on our website, please sign up for our newsletter to find out more about future shows. Please subscribe to Voices of the Community on Apple Podcast, Spotify, and Google Podcast, or wherever you get your podcast. You can follow us on Twitter, at George Coster, and we'd love to hear from you with feedback and show ideas. So send us an email to george at georgecoster.com. I'm George Coster in San Francisco, and thank you for listening.